Pill was baring his teeth so hard that the sheik told him to be careful or he would break his jaw. We were all shaking finally. To somehow revive our icy limbs, we stomped our feet on the floor of the truck until we were completely exhausted. The diesel engine of our Mercedes kept rumbling. We envied the driver in front who was protected from the cold by the cab of the truck. We blew steam out of our mouths, cursing the monstrous cold. That's how it was for us in March. It should have been spring by now, but instead it was winter again. A merciless, cruel winter, so cold that everything turned to brittle ice. The bluish-white snow crunched like glass underfoot, wrapped from head to toe. We travelled in open lorries. To keep warm, we began to pummel each other, making a scramble. But it was no use. We were still shivering and could hardly speak because our lips were frozen. We couldn't take our gloved hands off our noses, which hurt with every breath. That evening, for the first time, we heard the rumbling of the front, and at once the fear of that wild monster gave us goosebumps and strained all our nerves. Now the frost was not only on our outside, but also on our inside. The dreary leaden sky in solid cloud cover was cold, monotonous, utterly merciless. Everywhere you looked there was only snow, an endless expanse of snow. We reached a patch of wooded ground and passed a burnt log hut. Beside the ruins stood a bare, black, charred tree, and from the tree, like unseasonably grown giant fruit, hung three bodies completely naked, frozen to the hardness of stone, chins pressed against unnaturally long necks. The bodies dangled from the ropes, swaying in the breeze. One of them belonged to a woman. The icy wind played with her flexen-coloured hair, which reached to her hips and covered her breasts. She was dangling, tied by a sturdy bough overhanging the road. Horrified, we stared at the blue-covered legs and our throats constricted. I had to tilt my head to keep from hitting those feet. Towards evening, we came to a small village that had been partially destroyed, but there were several undamaged houses in which we could make a good stand. Baggage wagons and sledges were everywhere, and a few of our soldiers in fur overcoats were acting as sentries. We hopped down stiff and clumsy. A lieutenant came up, and our immediate superior, a wiry little sergeant, gave a report. The lieutenant cast a fleeting glance at us. So you're the new guys. Go over there, to that group of houses. Report to the non-commissioned officer. He'll put you somewhere with the others. And don't waste any time getting to bed. We move into position at dawn. The hut assigned to us was filled and smelled of sweat and mint tea. The musty air was so heavy you could cut it with a knife, but at least it was warm, even nauseatingly warm. There was no sign of the former owners. They had either escaped or been killed. We found a place among the last and huddled on the floor. There was nowhere to stretch out. The others barely paid attention to us. For supper, there were a couple of thick sausage sandwiches left over from our camp rations and a mug of hot tea. The tea tasted of mint and God knows what else. It was pitch dark outside, but behind the front line we could always see flashes of light, as during a grand fireworks display. The rumbling did not cease, the window panes kept shaking, and the flame of our smouldering candles flickered uneasily. I began to long for morning to come, with the devilish mess ahead, as well as my own deadly fatigue. Pressing my forehead against my cushioned legs, I tried my best to doze off, but to no avail. I needed to stretch out. Even old Franzel was restless. Peel had evidently given up trying to sleep as a useless occupation. He was absorbed in a conversation with Willie, which they were carrying on in a whisper. Most of the other boys were sound asleep, some in the most uncomfortable positions. It was evident that these frontline veterans had been in worse conditions. But now we had joined them, we were among those who would be called our heroes when we returned home. So we were going to be heroes a beguiling word, even enchanting. We storm a city, and in a few hours the whole world will know about all this, and when I return home my family and friends will say, Our Benno was there, he was in that snow. And if I get an award, everyone will whisper in awe, See that guy over there, that's a real man. And if I die, it will be a glorious death. The death of a hero on the battlefield. Besides, a man can't live forever, and no real man dies in bed. Take the obituary. Honourably departed, well, let them, my parents can rightfully say, sacrificed a son in the name of the fatherland. I knew there wasn't a word of truth in all this. My parents would be heartbroken, not at all proud of me. What about this death of a hero and so on? I remembered Sergeant Worm, and that cook from Hamburg lying on the road, and that ghastly pile of bodies in the shelter just a few hours ago. 
They had to be picked to pieces with a spade in order to bury them. And what about those three hanged men? The way they were swinging on their ropes, the girl's blonde hair over her naked body and those bluish legs. God Almighty, why must we all become heroes? But here we have no choice. Most of us were sure they were going to be killed. But which one of us? Maybe that dark-haired regular army soldier who scrunches his nose in his sleep, or the grunting bloke with his head stretched out like a bullet, with four days' stubble on his face, or that chunky-eared sergeant. Maybe it'll turn out to be red-haired Willio, or even myself. But who, who, who? Enough, I said to myself. Enough of this agonizing speculation. What does the shake say at times like this? If it stinks, mate, hold your bloody nose. There he is squatting, the rascal, and sleeping sweetly in spite of everything. His hat has slipped down over his nose, and his fingers are interlaced in the manner of a buckle on his imposing belly. One of the neighbours turned and pushed him. The sheik muttered something angrily and poked the fellow, but the old servant continued to snore, though he changed his posture. Sheik then sat up straight as a bolt, blinking, and yawned until tears welled up in his eyes. Nodding in the direction of the front line, he looked at me meaningly and said, What a hell of a rumble. Only now I noticed that the noise there had become much more intense. The rumbling was now continuous. The explosions of the heavier shells made our candles shake as if they too were afraid. Night attack, said a man with a bandaged head, the bandages on which had already become dirty. The sheik leaned forward. Now far is it from here? He asked in a whisper. Well, I think it's about two and a half kilometres, he replied, stretching his words. But if these guys have broken through, we might as well take up positions right here. Pill turned round. What kind of unit is this, anyway? He asked. The man made himself comfortable. He leisurely took out a short pipe with a bitten mouthpiece. Believe it or not. It'd be leave it or motorised regiment. We're from the 3rd Battalion. He paused. I suppose you'll be wondering where the bloody lorries are. Well, they're gone. The Russians destroyed them all. All we've got now are horse-drawn slides. We actually like them better. He had the same slow way of speaking as Kovac. Bill pointed his thumb at the window. What's it really like out there anyway? Is it always like this? The man with the bandage gave a curt chuckle and looked us over one by one. You guys have never been to the front before? Well, all I can say is you'll have a hell of a good time. He stared thoughtfully at his little pipe and continued. No, there's no need to panic at all. You'll soon get used to it. And it's not as bad as it looks from here. The thin, bushy-eyed, bearded feel. Felon raised himself up and leaned over, leaning on his long, bony arms. What are you talking about, you fool? It's not so bad. I never knew you were a fool. Listen to him, it's not that bad. Why don't you tell him why you have that rag on your skull? And when his opponent answered nothing, he went on. Very well then, let me tell you. It was a direct hit. Corton got off with a scratch, but five men from our company were gone. O.K. was one of them, a veteran. Always said he'd never get hit. He had a right to say that he had an old mum left with no one to look after her. Are you done, Xander? Grumbled the man with the bandage. But the big-eyed man kept talking. Last summer we beat the Russians to a pulp, almost playfully. Then came the cold and snow where they were in their element. Now they're attacking, and we're floundering here in snowdrifts all day and moaning from the bitter cold. We've been like this for months. We've been taking casualties after casualties. Do you hear that noise? Night attacks? That's what the Russians are good at? But I'm telling you it's like fighting a shadow, and before you know it, you've got a knife between your ribs, and then they're tanks. Corten wanted to say, but Zander shook his head indignantly and raised his voice. Have you ever seen a tank with a Soviet star on it in motion? If not, you'll have something to look at. And when you hear the clanking of their tracks and throw yourself into the snow, you'll remember me. And you'll also remember that little brat here who says it's not so bad at the front. You can't escape the thought that this monster is coming right at you. It's creeping forward very slowly, only a metre a second. But it's coming right at you and there's nothing you can do about it. Your rifle is useless. You might as well spit on your palm. Besides, it doesn't even occur to you to shoot. You just freeze like a mouse even though you feel like screaming in terror. You're afraid to lift a finger lest you anger the beast. You say to yourself, maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe he won't notice you. Maybe his attention is diverted to something else. But then a new thought arises that suddenly luck has turned away from you and he crawls right into your trench 
and you are dead or alive, that's when you need nerves as strong as steel cables. I saw Hansman, Ninth Company, fall under the tracks of a T-34. He hadn't dug himself a deep enough trench. He was too tired to dig. The tank turned slightly off its course, exactly enough to remove a layer of earth, and irked him lengthwise. In the next minute the man was leveled to the ground. The window shuddered slightly. In the sudden silence, Corton, the guy with the bandaged head, was puffing on his pipe. Then he asked, Where are you fellows from? A supply base, rear guard. Have you been transferred? Pill took a confused gulp of air. We asked to be transferred, he said at last. That line made Zanderperk. What am I hearing? You asked to come here? Jesus Christ, I'm going to die laughing. He gave a rude and cynical horse chuckle, nervously stroking his groveling face. Oh, you're one of those fierce idealists, are you? You want to die for the fatherland? Is that your idea? Or do you want to gain laurels for yourself? Playing heroes, perhaps? How would the Iron Cross second class look? A nice little ribbon of honour. Or maybe you'd like an Iron Cross first class. Wouldn't your dads be pleased? Rest assured, you'll get it. I guarantee it. Xander leaned forward, from which the left half of his tunic turned away, and only now we saw several wards above the left breast pocket. The Iron Cross first class in the middle. Xander removed the order and, with a contemptuous curl of his lips, tossed it to Pillay in his lap. And here's the cross, he said. You may wear it in your turn. In confusion, we looked first at Xander and then at Pilly. Pill sat like a statue, staring at the order in amazement as if it were something otherworldly. God Almighty, what kind of man was this Xander? Kovac then picked up the cross and tossed it back to Xander. Be careful, you big-eyed saint, he grumbled in his droning voice. Leave these guys alone. They're the best, trust me. Don't get burned on this. But Xander only grinned and lay back down. Then the chubby sergeant from across the room intervened. It's about time you stupid bastard shut up. Your grumbling is getting on people's nerves. Why the hell don't you all go to bed? He fell to the floor again. The sheik burped loudly. Franzel stretched out and snored. The thunder of heavy guns was not distant. I could feel the floor trembling. For a moment Xander sat up again and gave us an attentive frown. Then someone blew out the last candle. Sir Kay. I felt something was wrong. It was quieter. The distant rumbling was gone. The window panes no longer rattled. There were only isolated explosions. I looked at my watch. It was three o'clock. I should be fast asleep. Someone oped the door. Fresh air rushed in, piercing like a knife. The head-to-toe shrouded figure of a man with a machine gun appeared and shouted, hey, Everybody line up at once. This did not sound like a rude get-up from the lips of the petty officer in the barracks. It sounded more like the invitation of a maid to announce that dinner was served. All the same, everyone jumped up at once, putting on overcoats and uniforms. Full cartridge bags pulled down like pieces of lead. The icy wind blew all sleep from our eyes. We lined up in columns of three. Sharp command sound. Hmm. To the right. At ease, quick march. The night was pitch black. The chill wind penetrated to the very bones. We turned up our collars. No one spoke a word. The only sounds were the crunching of snow and the metallic sound of bayonets catching on sapper blades. Then the news was whispered through the column. They've broken through. A palpable menace hung in the air. Ahead, white flashes were constantly shooting up into the sky. They flickered like burning stars overhead. The machine gun rang out in short bursts. Separate rifle shots rang out. We marched up to these flashes then turned and stretched in a line along the edge of the forest. A command ran through the column, dig in. One of the old soldiers showed us how deep the trench should be. We'll throw the snow so that a rampart is formed, he said. The frozen ground was too hard. I took turns digging with Fransley, one digging, the other on guard, rifle at the ready. Soon a low wall of hard snow protected us from the front. There was no sign of a single Russian, but we were not at all eager to receive a baptism of fire. Individual shots had ceased, but flashes continued to appear without stopping. The rockets were fired from short-barreled signal pistols, a muffled whining sound, and the blinding fire with hissing sword into the sky, stopped for a moment at maximum height and again, slowly fading, descended to the ground. The whole space in front of us was awash with light. The wandering shadows were reminiscent of the afterlife, 
Again and again I thought I saw some movement, noted some vague outline, but it always turned out to be a stump or a bush. All the outlines were so unreal, as if from a bizarre, frightening dream. Several hours passed. It was beginning to dawn in the east. Weary of the long gaze into the darkness, we found our attention gradually waning, so I was startled when someone approached us from the side. Alt. Hmm. I shouted and instantly raised my rifle. Who's... Hey, shouted someone tall. Don't shoot. It was a non-commissioned officer, a real giant with huge bushy eyebrows and a neatly trimmed moustache. Are you one of the recruits who arrived last night? That's right. My answer sounded overly military in this situation. We were no longer on the training ground. The giant grinned. Mo, calm down. Come on, I have a job for you at the command observation post. We took Kovac, Willie, Pilly, and Sheik with us. A group of regular army soldiers were already waiting for us. Among them I recognized Xander. An officer came up and said that Sergeant Volt would show us the way. We were told to move with extreme caution. No one knew the exact location of the Russian positions. We made our way with the caution of Indians with the giant Volt in front. The front was once again revitalized. The enemy artillery opened a barrage of fire on the terrain. A couple of machine guns started up. The day promised to be sunny and clear. Mercy in flying weather, nut, someone said with disgust. We had to pass a battery of howitzers manned by Croatian artillerymen. They waved cheerfully and suddenly fired a salute over our heads. The rumbling of the guns made us awestruck. We covered our ears with our fists and opened our mouths. Then we cursed those croats, and they laughed with laughter. A few seconds later something heavy suddenly flew at us with a howl. We threw ourselves into the snow like lightning. The shell fell behind us and its target was clearly these gunners. We newcomers were the only ones who tried to take cover. All the others, apparently former frontline soldiers, remained unperturbed. Xander was full of... What's the matter? Morning prayer, he said, stretching the words. But the huge vote smiled at us. What flew over us with a howl is no danger, he said calmly. Such a shell always falls exactly behind our positions. After a short pause, it happened again. This time I stayed on my feet, but I had to summon up all my willpower, and Willie dived into the snow. The shrapnel explosion came just close to the Croatian battery. These guys were just taking a new position when the explosion of the third shell killed two of them. Now the whole unit was running away. The next shell hit right in the center of the position they were occupying. Several German fighter planes were flying above us. Then we also saw some Russian aeroplanes. These are fighters rated to, informed us a high non-commissioned officer. Just at that time appeared Messerschmitt. Why do not they shoot at each other? Surprise, Billet. This is your train of thought. Zed vote, stumping. But the Russian is happy not to be bothered, and our fighters do not get into a dead loop contest with the rats. Our planes are faster, but the rats are too damn maneuverable. The rats left us alone. Apparently, they had a better target in mind. Down the slope, we saw several small houses, almost undamaged. Vot told us to wait and disappeared into a house with a 10th Company sign on the door. Let's all go inside. One by one we went in. The room was filled with about twenty regular army soldiers squatting or lying on the floor, some cleaning their rifles or playing cards, others dozing. On the hard bedpost sat a lean, short-cropped man of about thirty-five wearing a grey jumper. A long face with a prominent chin complimented a pince-nez. This was our new commander, and Vogt called him Herr Oberleutnant. The thin man gave us a critical look. We stood at attention and called our names loudly and quickly, but we did not seem to make a favourable impression. Without rising from the bed, he said curtly, If you don't mind, I'd like to see you more energetic. You came in here as if you were tired veterans and you haven't done a damn thing yet. You'll realise things are different here. How long have you been in the service, by the way? That was too much. Barely containing my anger, I said, We were in a supply unit for six months. Then we volunteered for the front. Volunteered, you say? The tone of his voice softened a little. In that case, you don't need to explain what's going on here. The fate of Germany depends on units like this. We do not ask the question of what will happen to us. It's a matter for the whole nation. He probably wanted to say something else, but instead he sighed and looked at us intently. So you're volunteers, he summarized. That's right. 
Volunteers, Herr Oberleutnant. That's commendable. Then I have nothing more to say. I hope we'll get along well together. I'll tell you right away I won't tolerate sloppiness. All right. Xander and you three will stay here for now. You'll be in the first platoon. Xander will brief you on everything. The next four of you report next door to Sergeant Hegelberg. The rest of you go to the third platoon. Divide the men, vault, and take command of the company as before. I dare to make a request. Uh, no, no, Lutnant. Can't the six of us stay together because... What's the matter, sucker? shouted the thin lieutenant angrily. Special privileges so early? Consider yourself lucky to be in the same company. Not another word. Now get... Franzel and Kovac stayed with me. Pilly and Shake were in the second platoon. Willie was in the third. I caught Willie's anxious look at me and shrugged. There was nothing to be done about it at the moment. The thin lieutenant asked if I knew how to handle a machine gun. Yes, I do, I replied. Then go and replace the soldier on the anti-aircraft machine gun over there. I went to take the bloody duty. The old soldier was as happy as Petrushka at the fair when he saw me. A shift. That's great. Now I have time to sleep. But who the hell are you? I've never... I told him who I was, and that we were the new recruits. Reinforcements. That's just what we need. My name is Brodenfeld. The old man sent you here? Yeah. He's got quite a temper, doesn't he? Brodenfeld laughed without parting his lips. Hey, I suppose it didn't take him long to give you a headbutt. He always does that with newcomers. He's tough, old Welty. No one can resist him. Brodenfeld looked up at the sky. Then, on the other hand, he said, the lieutenant's a hell of a nice bloke. He's our company commander. Don't let him down, then you'll get what you want. I'm off. Keep your eyes open. I'm sure the Russians will be here any minute. Without much enthusiasm, I checked the machine gun. It had been adapted for anti-aircraft sites and mounted on a tripod. It had been a long time since I'd picked up a machine gun like that. This one had a drum instead of a belt. I checked the material and the sighting mechanism. I kept worrying that the Russians were coming. But here after hour passed and there were no Russian planes in sight. A squadron of dive bombers Stuka dreamed high in the sky. Bomb after bomb, they dropped on their way to the enemy positions. Messerschmitts and Heinkel with howling passed over us. It was a great day for the Luftwaffe. But the Russians seemed unwilling to take any chances and did not show themselves. In spite of the sun, which had already reached its zenith, I felt terribly cold, so I kept running round in circles and stamping my feet. It was time, I thought, for someone to take over. I hoped the old man hadn't forgotten about me. Besides, I began to feel hungry. Just then I heard the rumble of an aeroplane. Another squadron of junkers, damn it, I think it's the Russians. Quite a lot of fighters. The clumsy planes kept bunching up like they were having fun out there. Maybe we should give them some heat. Better not, they wouldn't find it amusing. After all, they didn't seem to have chosen us as their target. But when they were almost over us, one of the aeroplanes separated from the others, made a turn and spiralled steeply, firing all its barrels straight at our houses. I trembled with fear and excitement. I flashed a thought of climbing into cover when somewhere close by an anti-aircraft gun started talking. So I wasn't alone, I thought encouragingly. Still nervous, I took the safety off and selected a target. The fighter soared steeply, then banked and came at us a second time. This time it singled me out, its propellers buzzing like an angry giant hornet. I could see the fire from its barrels, and the next instant there was a whoosh, and a rain of bullets raining down with a thud all around me. Had he hit me? My knees trembled. There he was in the crosshairs of my sight. Pull the trigger. The machine gun had a terrible recoil, but as the bullets were fired, I forgot my fears and the pain in my shoulder. Now I had only one thought. To destroy this fire-spewing insect. I stuck to the shuddering machine gun and shot away at the damned aircraft as best I could. Then the weapon suddenly jammed, or did it? No, the magazine was empty. The enemy plane flew over, almost hitting my head, and disappeared behind the slope, and as if it was leaving behind a faint plume of smoke. Well, that nightmare was behind me, and I took a deep breath. My knees were suddenly wet. This was no joke after all. At least I'd made it through. Maybe the plane had crashed further away. Out Still, I'd shown the blokes around here I could defend my territory. They must have been watching from their windows, and I imagined them congratulating me. 
Then another bloke came to me, hunched over like an old man. You can go now, he said briefly. I'm your replacement. I was surprised that he had no comment on my shooting and said as casually as possible. I think I hit him. He was fuming. The chap made no reply at first. Finally, he grumbled unhappily. Why the hell did you leave the magazine empty? You think the damn thing charges itself. I returned to the flat badly hurt. Franzel told me that when I was firing, he was the only one paying attention. Oh yeah, there was another guy. He'd been asleep the whole time, but when this Russian was showering the roof with a hail of bullets, he got a piece of plaster on his face. That's what woke him up. He saw you from the window and said it would look a hell of a lot more spectacular if you had a machine gun belt, because there wasn't enough ammo in those pathetic drums. I thought I was being heroic. Now I realize that I've blundered. Etty Day. Here we are. Someone was standing in the aisle, stomping to shake the snow off their boots. First I saw the boots, then the overcoat covered in snow, and then the face under the officer's cap, and I jumped up as if from an electric shock. Mr. Lieutenant. He looked at me in Fransley. My God, it's... I can't believe it. Honestly, how did you get here? Let's shake hands, you rascals. That was Straub, Lieutenant Straub, who was our officer back at the training camp. Yeah, Lieutenant, I said. Galen, Jungling and Skulls are here too. Unfortunately, they were assigned to different platoons. Couldn't we all be in your platoon? I suppose we'll soon sort that out. Imagine that I've musketeers. How did you manage that? We went to another house, partially damaged but empty, so we could talk in peace. Franz all rushed after the others. It was a great reunion. Strab told us that he had been transferred to this company with a large number of freshly trained recruits from our former unit, but that many of them had already been killed in action. In turn, we told him what had happened to us. Straub now and then interjected his remarks into the conversation. He listened to most of our story with great interest. When we spoke of the sufferings of the Russian prisoners, he said, Many things cannot be prevented, but frankly speaking, I have very often been ashamed of being a German. Ekne. That evening we received orders to be on standby. We had to replace another company. We were now in Straub's platoon. He had arranged it with Wilty. We also had the pudgy-eyed Xander with us. When Straub saw Xander, their meeting was heated. They were obviously old friends, and Straub seemed to have a high opinion of Xander. We were quite surprised that a hardened pessimist like Xander and the poised but energetic Straub had such a good relationship. I was given a machine gun and Franzel was made second in command. Sheik was beyond angry when he was made ammunition carrier. We were about to leave when the Russians opened a barrage of artillery fire on our huts so that we ran out of them like scalded men. Only the company headquarters stayed put. There was no way we would have wanted to change places with the staffers. Then followed an hour and a half of stealthy marching, after which we were right on the front line. The terrain sloped down to form a ravine. The Russian machine gun nests were on the opposite side. We were divided into groups of two and detached to one of the dugouts, which were placed at intervals of about 25 meters along the edge of our side of the ravine. With mixed feelings, we took up positions in unprotected little trenches as deep as our thighs, where we were met by several regular army soldiers, blue with cold. They were glad to be changed. What a bunch of felons you are, they said. What took you so long to show up? The wretched moon cast a pale, cold light on the snowy landscape. On the other side of the ravine we saw machine gun bursts. Bullets whistled over our heads. If they think this will scare us, they've got the wrong people, Franzel said. We calculated the distance to the target, set our sights and answered with our MG-34s. Every sixth round was a tracer, and the plume of fire highlighted the exact spot where we'd seen the enemy's flashes of fire. The Russian machine guns snapped back viciously, and a desperate duel began. Every time the fire was on their side, we ducked our heads. They shot damnably well. Gradually, we lost interest in this duel and gave up. They stopped firing, too. I covered my machine gun with a tarpaulin to keep out the snow, which the gusty wind was beginning to whip up. At about one o'clock in the morning, we tried to keep warm by patting each other on the back as we had done before. At three, we cursed the mocking brilliance of the stars, the cold moon, the Russians, and this dirty war that had lifted us from our warm beds. At five we were stiff with cold, and so exhausted that we could hardly keep from falling asleep. After another two hours, 
Lieutenant Straub jumped into our tren. Hmm, how about doing a little reconnaissance? Jesus, sure. That'll keep us warm. Anything to get out of this trench? Hmm, fine, Straub said. In an hour and a half at company headquarters. And there's hot coffee waiting for you there. We waddled on stiff legs to the shelter. There we met Xander and Shike and Vogt, a giant non-commissioned officer and three other soldiers I didn't know. We drank hot coffee and cheerfulness of spirit returned to us. We put on white uniforms to be invisible in the snow, and when we followed the lieutenant we forgot about the cold, about that terrible night. We walked along the whole edge of the ravine, then went down the slope to no man's land. There was no sign of either enemy positions or ours. Only occasional shells shot randomly across the terrain. It is very unpleasant when you are between two firing positions and think how soon you will be detected by the enemy. The lieutenant pointed to a branching ravine and explained our task in a whisper. At the end of the ravine was a village. We were to find out whether it was in Russian hands, and if so, how large a force was holding it. All the senses were sharpened, and the guns at the ready at the hip. We moved cautiously, listening for the slightest sound. Suddenly the village was right in front of us. We hid and tried to get our bearings before moving on. Xander had a stomach ache. I don't know what's wrong, he said. I don't feel well. But before he could say anything else, Sheik interrupted. Hey, I know what you mean. It's a bloody unpleasant feeling. I had that once when I drank a lot of beer with cucumbers. Vot wrinkled his nose like he was going to sneeze, but he just laughed. We all laughed, and it took the edge off. We felt better now. Only Xander kept complaining as if he'd never been interrupted, and his words echoed in my ears. It feels weird inside, guys, he said. We're going to get caught in a bind tonight. I'm sure they blocked our escape route. I bet we're trapped, don't you? No one answered, but no one laughed either. The lieutenant took the binoculars and looked closely at the village. Hmm, Xander, he said. Look over there, up ahead. Is that a man or a dog lying on the road? Xander put the binoculars to his eyes. No, do you need glasses? He joked. It's a man, quite obviously, and he's lying on his back. Must have been murdered. We'll have to go into the village, Straub said. Hmm, into the village. Xander exclaimed mockingly. Do you think I'm crazy? Do you want to find a nice corner for a mass grave or a free trip to Siberia? The lieutenant continued to stare nonchalantly through his binoculars. After a while, as if he suddenly had an idea, he said, Shut up, Xander, that's the speech of a rebel. I'm as sick of you as a boil in my arse. You can stay here if you're so afraid. Xander ran the back of his hand over his beard, his lips curling into a sinister grin. We made our way cautiously along the edge of the village. Ready for any surprise, we surveyed the first hut. Empty, abandoned. It was the same everywhere else. It seemed as if the inhabitants had suddenly left the village all at once. In many huts we found uneaten food on the tables. Pots of meat chowder hung over extinguished hearths. Most of the doors were wide open. It all looked very strange and ominous. Xander was right. The man lying in the road was dead, a civilian. His skull was fractured, his face contorted with a grimace of horror. In the distance we saw two more dead. Then in the hut we came upon a woman bent over a table as if she were dozing. Her head had been shot through. Nearby lay an uneaten piece of bread with butter and a blood stain on it as if it had been jam. What tragedy had been played out here? We looked on in profound silence. It was as if we had stepped on forbidden ground. We involuntarily turned to whispers, and our voices sounded hoarse. We were now making our way towards the manor house at the back of the road. Xander and Sheik stepped forward to inspect it. The lieutenant said that we would soon be moving back, our task accomplished. There was no particular need, he said, to look in all the other houses. I was just about to follow the other two into the peasant's house when Franzel suddenly nudged me with his elbow in great excitement. Look over there. At the same instant, the lieutenant commanded in a whisper. Us, hurry to cover. Behind that house, come on. Russians. I ran for the house with all my legs, and there I was, out of breath, standing behind the wall, my heart pounding hard. It was clear that the Russians had discovered us and were hiding behind the nearest huts, no doubt a group of scouts like us. Carefully, centimetre by centimetre, I brought my machine gun forward. 
Then Shaik and Xander suddenly appeared in the doorway. Look out. I shouted to them. Get in here. Sheik was so dazed that he hesitated for a moment, but Xander instantly assessed the situation and threw himself to the ground, dragging Shaik with him. Bullets, apparently fired from automatic rifles, rained down on the wall. Xander, wriggling like a marten, reached us, but before the lanky Sheik reached the wall that sheltered us, he twisted in pain and grabbed his leg with a roar. Franzel sprang at him with lightning speed, put his arm round him and dragged him to us, while the bullets were pounding the wall in an endless hail and whistling overhead. The Sheik was wounded in the upper thigh. One of our regular army soldiers was trained in first aid. He cut along the trouser leg of Sheik's leg and ripped open his underpants. The wound looked terrible. The snow was stained red. The rescuer calmly bandaged Sheik. Sheik roared in pain, his face contorted with a grimace. Then he suddenly calmed down at once. What a devilish mess, he said. Damn scoundrels. Thank God. He had regained his composure. He'll be all right. The rescuer continued his work, only smirking when Sheik's tongue got out of control. Meanwhile, I had my machine gun ready and was ready to fire. Wait. The lieutenant stopped me with a gesture. Maybe we shouldn't show them that we have a machine gun right now. The Russians were spreading out, surrounding us in a big arc. They intended to flank us. The situation was getting more hopeless by the minute. We were forced to huddle together, and the weak cover gave us no chance of escape. To top it all off, we had a wounded man. And the Russians looked at us like hawks at prey. Franzel put his steel helmet on a stick and stuck it out from behind a corner, and a hail of bullets followed the flash. Now the bullets were whistling from the side, right next to his ear. If this keeps up, they're going to get us in the crossfire. Straub had a word with Xander and Sergeant Vogt. Then he turned to me. Listen carefully. Three of us will try to outflank the Russians. You will cover us with fire. The rest of us will show them what we can do. If the plan succeeds, we can drive them right into your hands. But for God's sake, don't manage to shoot at your own men. Bell Faithbell, you'll take command here. Xander collected all our hand grenades and shared them with Vogt and the lieutenant. We took aim at the points where we thought the Russians would be. Ready? asked the lieutenant. Yes, sir. Xander was suddenly transformed. His voice sounded firm and clear, and he stopped slouching. The contemptuous grimace was gone from his lips. The lieutenant was giving his final instructions. All right, let's go. Continuous fire. There was a deafening rumble. I used up two machine gun ribbons without a single misfire. The others raised their heads just enough to fire their carbines like crazy. Even the wounded sheik was shouting at the top of his voice. That's the talk. Give them some heat, you lousy bastards. Give them a light. The Russians fled. They didn't dare to take any more risks. The unexpected attack took them by surprise. Pieces of plaster bounced off the houses and the snow on the road rose, swirling under the impact of the bullets. Straub, Sander and Vogt reached the last houses and disappeared from sight. Franzel snatched up a replacement barrel he had brought with him, and we quickly replaced the red-hot barrel of the machine gun. Just as I began to aim again, I saw a Russian running across the road and toppled him with a cue halfway across. Another cautiously sprang up, but before he came out of cover, I gave a short cue right under his nose, and he fell again. I then kept up a steady fire on them, Franz all passing me ribbon after ribbon. The field fell put his hand on my shoulder. Hmm, careful, he said. I've just spotted one of ours over there. I think they've already got the Russians in the rear. But in the meantime, the Russians had regrouped and were showering us with a hail of bullets, so we had to take cover behind the wall. Minutes of tense waiting followed, and we wondered whether we had managed to get through at all. Suddenly there was a thud, then another, almost merging into a general explosion, and grenades. Then fiercely, frantically, like a drumbeat, the automatic rifles began to sound. Their sound was the same as our own. Two Russians were running right into my line of fire. Quickly I pulled the trigger, and there they were, squirming in the snow. We heard the high, whirring sound of a Russian submachine gun, then a second one, then the explosion of hand grenades again. Suddenly there was silence. Then came a shriek, followed by a single shot. Then we saw our giant non-commissioned officer in the middle of the road waving his helmet at us. There were fourteen Russians, each with a machine gun. Three were dead, five wounded. One lay moaning in the snow red with blood. He was hopeless. 
The Russians who remained unharmed dropped their machine guns and stood waiting with their hands raised, anxiously watching our actions. Straub let them take care of their wounded and distributed their weapons to us. We moved on our way back. In front was Sergeant Vaught, who had a slight bullet wound, then followed the prisoners, dragging their wounded, the dying man we left on the spot. Despite his protests, Franzel and the rescuer put the sheik on an improvised stretcher and carried him. Sheik protested, saying he could walk on his own if he was supported. You moron, Franzel shouted at him. You'd better shut up. Lie still and shut your mouth. Lieutenant Straub, let us pass forward. A moment later we heard a pistol shot. I had been waiting for it. I knew he would do the right thing. Taking his time, he caught up with us. That same day towards evening, the whole company moved in a long, winding column towards the village to occupy it. Only the third platoon remained in the same position. Straub said that Franzel and I could stay behind and join the others later, but we wanted to be with our friends and said we didn't need rest. It was not easy to part with old Shaikh. We shook hands and didn't know what to say. Give our best wishes to your family when you get back home. Take care of yourself, old chap. For Pill, the parting seemed to be the hardest part. He had lost his old sparring partner. Hmm, go away, Pillio muttered. It's a damn good thing I won't see you again. But he squeezed his hand so hard that Sheik grimaced in pain. Guilty ordered the attack, but the deployment wasn't so easy. We had to climb steep slopes. We had to get the Russians in a pincer at all costs. Finally, we moved forward. They met us with furious small arms fire. He was joined by a couple of machine guns. The second platoon was the first to suffer casualties. Without cover, we ran through the snow, occasionally falling in the snow, moving crawling on our stomachs. Once we reached the houses, it would be easier to move. The heavy machine guns allocated to us formed a curtain of fire in front of the village. As soon as they found themselves, they were fired upon. I myself was also firing continuously. The recoil of the guns and the terrible rumbling kept our morale. They gave us a sense of strength and self-confidence. The outer row of houses became a sieve. There were holes in the walls. Windows were broken out. The Russians began to withdraw. We rushed into the first houses, searched them, and occupied each one with a fight. Several times we met strong resistance, but steadily continued to advance. There were also casualties on our side. I saw Kovac dragging one of our soldiers to cover. His stomach was torn open. A field fell, Fabel collapsed, bleeding, at his machine gun. Hand grenades were bursting. Straub pointed to one of the largest houses. I fired at the doors and windows. Five Russians threw their rifles into the road as a sign that they were surrendering. Again, as usual, the same nastiness is repeated. As soon as we have dead men, this pig holds on to their rations. It's always the same with chocolate and cigarettes. What do you think those greedy types do with them? Filling their bellies while we're in the trenches. Don't be so hasty, said the cook, stammering. If the old man hears you, there'll be trouble. Shut your mouth, you fat hog. Next time, if you don't cook enough, you'll end up in the cauldron yourself. You've been fattening up for a long time. The field surgeon came round in the evening that day and asked if anyone had any complaints. I signed and I had something with my feet. We were taken in a horse-drawn sleigh to the battalion headquarters. It was crowded and we had to wait for a long time. After several attempts, I managed to take off my boots. When I pulled off my socks, large shreds of leather were stuck to them. My toes were covered in blisters, and my heels, God Almighty, what a sight, a rotting open wound, almost black but not bleeding. The soldier beside me clutched his nose. Mate, he exclaimed, you're already rotting. Boy, what a... Then the paramedic examined me. Piece by piece, very carefully, he removed the rest of the skin from... What do you do? He asked me. I joined the army right after school, Mr. Felcher, I answered. Mm-hmm, was all he said in reply. What is he doing? I thought, as he plunged the forceps deep into my heel. Do you feel anything? He asked. Not much at all. Well, maybe you were lucky after all, he muttered. Now I was really worried. One consulant. At least I wouldn't be in this damn race for a while. Now. The medic told me that he would bring me my satchel the next day. I wouldn't be going anywhere until then. Hmm. Tell Franzel Elmer, will you? I asked him. N.A. Because the field hospital was overcrowded. 
I was put in a room in a small base unit. The first person I saw there was Corton, a guy with a bandaged head. He was looking at some pictures and talking to a guy with straw-coloured hair who looked like a movie star. What are you doing here? he exclaimed. I thought you were at the front. I told him about my frostbite and that I was being hospitalised. When I began to tell him about Xander, he shook his head sadly. Hey, so he didn't escape death after all. We thought he was bulletproof. If you ask me, old Xander considered himself a model warrior. He's been acting rather unusual these last few days. Who is this Xander? The blonde asked. You mean the guy with the Iron Cross First Class, the one the Russians captured with Lieutenant Straub? No, so, exclaimed I. Were those two captured by the Russians? Hmm, quite right, said Corton. Only for a couple of days. Then they made a breach and fought their way back to our position. They must have been terrified. What kind of a man was this Xander? I asked. I could never understand him, Corten replied. But one thing is certain. He was not a whiner, as you might think from his constant complaints about stomach pains. The way he made all you new buys nervous was very characteristic of him. Strange sense of humor. Ah, nudder. Didn't he once save Straub's life? Film star interject. That's right. But, you see, that's the thing. You could always count on old Sander at the decisive moment. He's done a lot of other things. There's a whole bunch of blokes who'd have relied on Xander. What did he do? I mean, before this damn war. Hey, you wouldn't believe it, but he was a bloody artist. He showed me his drawings once. They showed dead soldiers lying around, their bodies horribly disfigured, giving me the creeps. I was shocked, but when I told him about it, he just grinned. But I know one thing. Old Xander hated war more than any of us. Our conversation turned to the subject of furloughs and girls. Corten showed me a picture, just a pretty girl, in a Red Cross medic's uniform. Hmm, that's Rawls fiance. The handsome Rawl smiled proudly, showing off his white even teeth. I say she's good, isn't she? Corten concluded. And still that rascal is after every skirt. There were two Russians in our house, a husband and wife. He was about fifty years old. He was a small, stupid-looking man with a long grey beard. His wife was as round as a barrel, and had they both slept on a bench near the stove. The bench was long and narrow, so they did not fit side by side, but lay head to foot. At night, I needed to go to the lavatory. It was pitch dark, so I lit a match. People were lying all over the place, and I had to be careful not to step on anyone. I lit another match, and what do I see? A pudgy little woman and old Raoul lying there, hugging each other tight. He clung to the woman like she was his precious life, so that he wouldn't fall off the narrow bench. And the old bearded man was at their feet and slept the sleep of the righteous. Towards morning I heard a noise. Two Russians were making up their minds. Finally the woman took a basket, threw some things in it, smiled embarrassedly and left. He threw the old bitch out, said the man who knew a little Russian. What did he say to her? Well, he was talking rubbish about dirty business. What kind of dirty business? I have no idea. He didn't say what it was. So the old man didn't fall asleep so fast after all. I kept my mouth shut, of course. As for all, he played innocent. Franzel dropped by to say goodbye to me. Near my, Kivak and Willie send their best wishes, me, he said. Willie asked me to give you his slippers. He says you'll need them in the hospital, but don't wear them out too much. You know how Willie loves those slippers his mum made for him with her own hands. I hesitated to take those slippers. That Willie's a real sweet kid. Maybe you'll meet the Sheik, Franzel said. Drop us a line or two about how you're doing. Pekatinets V, Stalingrade P top two. I didn't know what to say. I just shook his hand. We look forward to your imminent return. Don't forget we need you here, you know. Lieutenant Straub showed up a little later. Alk about your frostbite. It's not good, I'll tell you that. I don't envy it, but who knows, maybe it's for the best. If they send you to the front again, try to get into our company. That evening a huge sledge with lightly and severely wounded men, a few of each, set off to take us to the field hospital. I too sat in them, wrapped in blankets. Suddenly that little gorilla showed up again, with a basket in her hand and an embarrassed smile on her face. The old man looked at her blinking, in utter amazement. Then they spoke to each other quite calmly and were soon on their way to the door, hand in hand, 
in an ideal of marital bliss. Evidently the night's interlude had been forgotten and the woman forgiven. The sleigh glided towards the evening sunset. The sun was setting, shimmering with enchanting colours. Angels in heaven bake bread, Xander would say. Now Xander was dead, and the survivors were preparing for a new battle. I was partly glad I wasn't with them. Now I had a bit of a peaceful life ahead of me. It was a gift from God, and I knew how I would use it.